Do you want to know if it's possible to build a Klarna pay later system purely using serverless? In this video, that is exactly what I'm going to show you how to do. Hi guys, my name is Sam with Complete Coding, where our aim is to make you into the best serverless and software developer that you can be. In this video, we're going to be looking at how to architect a completely serverless system, which allows you to take payments over a longer duration, similar to a system like Klarna. This is a really cool application and we're going to be leveraging Stripe so we don't even need to handle any of the card data, which would add a load of extra complexity and compliance paperwork. Let's jump onto the lightboard and start drawing out that architecture. So our architecture is going to start with, of course, our user over here. And whenever they are on a website for checking out on some clothing, let's say, they might see a button which says, check out with complete coding pay. What this will do when they click on it is it will open up our own little mini web application. And on that, we're gonna do a couple of initial steps. We're gonna have a slider which allows them to choose how many months and how much they want to pay. So how do they want to spread those payments? Once they have chosen their payment schedule, we can then actually embed the Stripe API and the Stripe UI into our little web page, which will allow them to enter either their card details or their bank details and go through basically a checkout step with Stripe saying, I'm going to set up a direct debit to pay you the amount I said for the number of months I said I wanted to pay it over. We use Stripe here because we don't actually want to hold any of the card details ourselves because that requires a lot more security checks, a lot more compliance and paperwork, and Stripe can do all of that for us. What Stripe will do is once it has processed that direct debit setup, it will actually give us a payment reference ID, which is not referenceable to the card details, but gives us something that we can associate with that user's payments. What we can now do is have that user fill out maybe some extra details like their name and email address and a password so they can log in and check their payments. Once we have gathered all of the user's information, so that is the payment ID, as well as some user details. Let's just call it, yeah, user details. Then we are able to actually store that. So what we're going to do is we're going to make an API request to our own API gateway. And this API gateway is then going to call a Lambda function, which is going to write some data into a DynamoDB table. And in this DynamoDB table, we're going to probably create a couple of different records. The first is a user record. And with this user record, we're actually going to allow them to not just give them our name and email, we're actually going to allow them to set up a Cognito user. And this Cognito user is going to allow them to log into the app at a later date so that they can access their payments. So our user is going to have our Cognito user ID. So ID equals Cognito user ID. And that's basically all we need. So with, as well as that Cognito user ID, we're going to have some other sets of details such as their name, if we have their address or anything else that we need to contact them later, or we just want to show inside our billing application. As well as the user, we have an order. And this order is going to basically be what they have bought. So this is going to have 
a ID, which is just going to be a random ID for the order. We're then also going to have a partition key, and the partition key is going to be user ID, which we can get from Cognito. And then the SK or the sort key is going to be order hashtag. And then here we're going to say a status of the order. So status. And that could be either paid if they've paid all of their payments. It could be in payment. So they're currently paid or it could be overdue if they have missed one of their payments. With this, we're able to show them, get me all of the overdue orders for this user, which is quite a nice functionality. We're also gonna have other details on here about the order, so the items that have been ordered, the shop that it's been ordered through, and any other details we want to store. As well as the order, let's say there are gonna be three payments, one payment per month, so what we want to do is also create three payment records. These payment records, again, are going to have an ID and a partition key. And the partition key in our case, again, is going to be user ID. We're also going to have an SK. The SK is going to be payment hashtag and again we're going to use this compound key that we used up here and we're going to say that it's payment hashtag then order id hashtag status hashtag payment ID. Now this is obviously quite a long sort key, but what it allows us to do is it allows us to say either get me every payment for this user ID where SK equals payment hashtag order ID. So get me all of the order payments for this specific order. We could also say get me every payment hashtag order hashtag and then this could be overdue. So get me all of the overdue payments for this order. And this allows us to basically have a little bit of the ability to narrow down what we're actually returning as results. We could also add another way of querying on this. We could do, we want to see all payments, not grouped by order ID first, but grouped by status. So here, we're going to have to add a second partition key. So it's going to be a second global secondary index. Again, it's always going to be on the user's ID. But the SK2, again, is going to be payment hashtag. But we're going to go with status hashtag order hashtag payment ID. This allows us to say, look on the second of our global secondary indexes, query where PK2 is the user ID, but SK2 starts with payment hashtag overdue. This allows us to get all of the overdue payments for a single user, instead of having to do that five or six times for each order. This ability to create multiple global secondary indexes and design the sort keys to group things in different orders is a really powerful way to utilize DynamoDB. One other thing we're going to add to all of this payment record is a TTL or a time to live. This is a field inside the whole payment record, which says, once the date reaches this certain timestamp, I want you to delete this record. So that TTL 
will be set for approximately, let's say, about two days after payment due. So what this means is that two days after the payment is due, if we've not changed this record at all, what is going to happen is this Dynamo table is going to delete the payment record and that is going to cause a stream. That stream is going to call this lambda called overdue payment. This overdue payment lambda can then do basically a couple of things based on what we want to do. We can call um, a service like SES, which is simple email service, to send an email to our user saying, hey, you've missed your payment, what's going on? We could also query from here to the Stripe API saying, hey, we don't seem to have been paid for this order or this payment. Has there been a mistake or actually have they not paid? Now, the question is, what happens if they do pay? Well, what we do is either in the same API gateway or we could probably better to create a second API gateway, which is accessed from Stripe and whenever a user does make a payment, Stripe will call our webhook API. This will call another lambda of payments. And this payments lambda will look into our database and it will be able to find the order that they are being paid for, as well as the payment that has been made. If they have made that payment, we can obviously change the status in all of these cases here and here. So now instead of it being payment pending, it's now paid, which is a nice feeling. As well as that, what we can do is we can actually just delete the TTL field from this whole record. And because this is a NoSQL database, you can just delete fields from a record. And now that we have deleted that, we don't have a TTL. So this automatic stream generation won't happen because this record won't automatically be deleted. This is a cool way of using Dynamo TTLs to optionally automatically generate or trigger a Lambda to contact a user. One thing that you could do to take this another step further is every time there is an overdue payment, you could actually store that into a separate DynamoDB table that is accessible by an application for customer services. This is your team of support people who are able to look at all of the missed payments and even though the email has gone out to them saying, hey, you've missed a payment. These people will be able to follow up with just the people who they know have missed a payment to make sure that your payment over time system stays profitable in the long run. In this video, we have learned how we can architect and design an application which allows us to set up a payment system where a user can pay over a series of months. We've used API Gateway to create endpoints and Cognito to allow us to secure those endpoints. We've then used Dynamo to store all of our data, but we've used TTLs or time to lives to allow us to automatically trigger other events when payments aren't made. This is a really cool application and using these different technologies together can be used in loads of other application architecture as well. If you're really serious about becoming a software engineer, then building just one project won't cut it. So I've actually created a video that shows you not one, but seven different application architectures 
that you can build to progressively introduce you to serverless and become an awesome serverless developer. You can check out that video here and start your journey to becoming an awesome software developer.